Okay, great. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Reduce 101, what you need to know to electrify everything. I'm Liz Morrison. I'm a mobility analyst with GreenBiz and I'll be moderating and hosting the session. The next 45 minutes will feature three experts in buildings, fleets, and industrial processes explaining the opportunities and challenges in the electrification revolution. Now, before we get started, I wanted to run through a few housekeeping items. Uh, firstly, this session is being recorded and will be available on demand following the event. Secondly, please take note of the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen and take a moment to share with us who you are and where you're from. Uh, please also find the question and answer Q&A tab, where at any point during this conversation, you can pose a question to any of our speakers. And please be sure to indicate who the question is addressed to. If you see a question that you would like to have answered posed by somebody else, then please go ahead and upvote it. So we will be fielding the top questions to our speakers at the end of this portion for the last 15 minutes. So let's get started. Uh, our panelists today, in the order they will be speaking, are Ali Hassanbagi, who is the founder and CEO of Global Efficiency Intelligence. Mike Roth, who is the executive director of the North American Council for Freight Efficiency. And Millie Majumdar, who is the senior vice president of the U.S. Green Building Council. Ali, if you could please start us off with an introduction. Uh, what are the opportunities and challenges that you face in the electrification of industrial processes? Thank you, Liz, uh, for the introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ali Hassan Beghi uh, from Global Efficiency Intelligence. So we are a consulting firm in the US, primarily focusing on industrial energy efficiency and decarbonization of manufacturing sector. Talking about decarbonization, electrification is definitely one of the tools in the toolbox. And I've been given a few minutes to talk at the higher level about electrification in industry. Uh, industry, as you know, compared to other sectors of economy, is more challenging because it's more complex. That's why people are talking about hard to abate sectors. And this complexity not only shows itself on energy efficiency and other aspects of decarbonization, also when talking about electrification, uh, this complexity of industry, because we have literally hundreds of industry, uh, pose some uh, challenges that we need to overcome. Uh, but also it provides some opportunity because we have just such a variety of industries. Uh, we have some sweet spot that we can start with. Um, so when you look at manufacturing, uh, uh, this graph shows the US manufacturing energy used by end users. By end users meaning you know, process heating, CHP, conventional boilers, or machine drives. Um, you can see about two thirds of the energy use is related to thermal processes, uh, whether it's process heating or conventional boiler or CHP, which generate both the steam and electricity. So when we talk about electrification, that's the big chunk we are trying to address, uh, moving away from fuel to electrify. When talking about electrification of industry, uh, some people jump into conclusion quick that it's difficult. For example, some sector like cement industry and others, which are high temperature at the moment, we don't have commercial technologies for electrification uh, and kind of some discouraging messages, but actually not all industries are the same. As you can see from this graph, industrial heat demand profile varies significantly across different sector. Significant portion of heat used in many of the industrial sectors are low temperature heat below 100 degrees C or medium temperature heat below, you know, three, 400 degrees C. Uh, and while some of the industries like cement, steel, and some chemicals, they do have high temperature needs. Uh, fortunately for some of those, uh, for example, for steel industry, we have a very mature electrified technology, electric arc furnaces. 
But for some other, we need to go develop. But we have a lot of other process heat demand industry that is low and medium temperature. And relatively speaking, when you have low temperature or medium temperature, it's easier to electrify. Uh, this is another graph by my colleagues in NREL shows that two thirds of the process heat in the industry, US industry, is uh, for application below 300 degrees C. So uh, the message here is uh, don't get discouraged that you know there are some high temperature processes that are difficult to uh, electrify, which we need to tackle those as well. But we have a huge chunk of process heat demand in industry uh, that are low medium temperature and we can start there. And there are some, uh, as I said, sweet spot that we can go and electrify even today if uh, we can um, overcome some of the barriers with regards to cost and um, other issues. Uh, so we know the profile of the energy or heat demand in industry varies whether by temperature or application, but fortunately we have a wide variety of electrification technology for industry. So electric boilers are one category that you go and change boiler in your boiler room and don't touch your process. But then there are a variety of other applications of electrification technologies that can electrify the end use heat itself because a lot of time the steam is not needed for process. It's the heat that is needed. The steam is just the carrier of the heat. So you can just use alternative electrification technology like heat pump, like radio frequency dryer, name it, uh, to provide that heat without the need for a steam or direct fire heater. So we actually recently published uh, a report, a pretty extensive detailed report uh, shown here. Uh, it's over 100. 20 pages, we really dive deep into some of these aspects of electrification for industry and sh uh, conducted a techno-economic analysis showing the potential, explaining the technologies, but also uh, explaining some of the barriers and also having you know some action plans, like six, seven pages at least, that different actors, stakeholders uh, should take in order to electrify industry. And very briefly to show you what we have done, um, we looked at those 13 sectors that are listed there. You can see we have some energy intensive sector, some you know lighter industries, and also one separate scenarios for electrification of all industrial boilers. So we looked at each sector and we examined the you know profile of heat uh, that is used and the existing heating system, and then based on the you know temperature and how heat is, is used and other uh, contexts of the industry, we selected some of the electrification technology applicable, and conducted some you know, process integration assessment, and then from that we calculate energy, GSG emission, and also some cost implication. For each of those sectors, we have done the analysis and presented the result in very detail. So if you are interested, I encourage you to look at the report. And this is just a snapshot just for one aggregate uh, graph of the result for 2050 for all the industries that we have uh, identified the electrification potential for. And this graph shows the change in sectors net CO2 emission after electrification. And the numbers are negative because the change means reduction. Uh, as you can see for some sector, we get really massive amount of CO2 emission reduction in 2050. And we assume by 2050 grid will be decarbonized enough. And if you calculate the cumulative over you know, the decades that we have quantified this, we are talking about gigaton scale CO2 emission reduction. Again, I can't go into detail of this, but uh, if you're interested, you can look into our report. Uh, so, sorry I uh, <laughs> spoke quickly. I was given only five minutes. Hopefully, I didn't go over time. But uh, if you are interested, uh, you can download the report. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask later in the session or email me. I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Liz. Back to you. Thank you, Ali. Um, can you please provide that link uh, to that report in the chat box here so the attendees can be able to access that? Sure. Thank I'll you so that. much. Any other resources that you'd like to provide to the attendees, please also just feel free to put them in the chat box. That goes for any of the speakers here today as well. Thank you very much for that overview. Uh, if anybody else has any any questions uh, regarding anything that Ali has just spoken about, then please go ahead and 
pose your questions in the Q&A and we will be able to get to those at the end of the session. Okay, next, moving along to you, Mike. Can you please outline what opportunities and challenges you see in the electrification of fleets? Yeah, so our work, uh, I'm happy to be here, Liz, and excited to share some thoughts. Our work in fleets is in trucking, so, um, and, and moving freight, so um, electric trucks. And our focus is in North America because we're the North American Council for Freight Efficiency. But um, really what's happening in North America with respect to electrifying moving goods by truck is pretty similar to what's going on around the world. And that is uh, that the, um, uh, you know, most of these trucks are diesel. So we're talking about um, vans and trucks in the U.S. Class 3 up to Class 8, which is the heavy duty tractor trailers on the freeways. Um, in the smaller classes, some are gasoline powered, but predominantly all have um, internal combustion engines. And they have had for a long time. I mean, they've got some unique challenges um, different, differentiating them from passenger cars. Uh, they move, um, you know, lots of freight. Uh, and so, you know, these tractor trailers have a U.S. limit of 80,000 pounds, 80,000 pounds. And so they'll have as much as 50,000 pounds of load. Um, in the back of the of the trailer, which is a you know pretty big weight for to consider a battery moving that any distance. They also travel long distances. Um, you know, anytime you get outside of the um, uh, very specific urban environment, you know, New York City and other places, uh, they they have they have miles of travel. So some of the challenges in electrifying these trucks. But what we found in our work, we've been working, and I'll put some some uh, links in the chat here in a minute. Um, in our work in electrification and trucking is that the electric truck, you know, the, the battery, um, uh, power electronics and the uh, motors are very simple powertrain for these trucks. I mean, these diesel trucks are now extremely clean. The NOx and particulate matter is very low, but it's required the diesel engine become quite complex. So there's a lot of components on these diesel trucks to have that emissions be low. Um, but it causes, um, it, you know, additional cost and um, and challenges for those for the that diesel those diesel trucks, and that um, you know that 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 uh, is a reason why these electric trucks are um, you know really being looked at as a solution for uh, for the industry. I want to share a, a slide sort of to uh, to, to discuss that then. Um, but the uh, you know some would say well with these trucks if range is an issue why don't we go to hybrids why don't we go to some renewable fuels like renewable natural gas renewable diesel and other things and those are being uh, considered and worked on but the elegantly simple design of these trucks is uh, you know is really uh, uh, an opportunity that fleets are seeing particularly in the smaller smaller trucks um, and then um, you know sort of going up in scale so. Uh, let me just walk through really quickly the the small delivery trucks uh you know where there might be 40 or 50 miles of range e-commerce um urban settings we believe will go battery electric you know kind of as fast as the infrastructure will will allow um those trucks are showing a pretty good total cost of ownership already uh for those fleets and we're seeing that start to, to really progress as the trucks become available and then when you move up into the larger trucks um you know return to base tractor trailers, return to base um, uh, large trucks. We see there um, electrification also being a, a real key uh, that will allow um, uh, an adoption to start to grow. But it's in the heavy duty semi trucks where uh, the challenges exist. I mean, maybe most have heard about the Tesla semi. There are products from Daimler and uh, Volvo and other companies entering the market right now and um, those are currently uh, limited in their um, in their uh, range and in their ability to, to perform. So I'm having a little trouble getting my slides set up. So I'm just going to pass on that. Right now, we are um, uh, creating or we're running a program called Run On Less Electric. So I'd ask everybody to take a look over the next couple of months at RunOnLess.com, and you'll see uh, where we've gathered 13 of the current truck deployments going on. We're out interviewing about 100 people associated with those 13 and site visits all over the U.S. and Canada. We have little trucks in New York City. I call them little. You know, you might call them bigger, but smaller trucks in New York City, um, you know, Charlotte, Chicago. We have larger trucks in California, Montreal, Vancouver. 
And what we're doing here is is getting down to talk to the drivers, the maintenance people, the folks running these trucks, the folks that have built these trucks to get a real good assessment of on the ground what's really happening. So starting next week, we'll have profile videos of those. And, and what, we're, what we're seeing is that not all trucks need very fast charging for long distances. Many trucks operate shorter distances with really long dwell times where they can charge slow chargers all night long, do their goods movement during the day. And, uh, and those will be the early adopters as we scale electric trucks throughout the, uh, throughout the commercial truck business. So again, I'll put some of those links in there. RenOS.com will be a, a real good place to, to, to learn um, through August and September uh, while, we, uh, while we run the, uh, the project. Thanks, Liz. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. I'm disappointed that uh, you weren't able to share some of your slides. You had some really cool visuals there. I uh, figure it out, then uh, let's pop that up on the screen maybe during the Q&A portion at the end. We had some people requesting some visuals from you over here. So I... Uh, we will uh, move along here to um, Millie. And just as a quick reminder to everybody, if you have questions, then please um, put them in the Q&A tab. It's uh, three down from the chat tab there on your right-hand side. So please pose your questions there. Now uh, moving on to Millie, uh, could you please tell us some opportunities and challenges that you see in the electrification of buildings? I, I understand that this is um, very uh, country to country in terms of uh, the challenges and opportunities. So I believe that you're focusing on the United States, correct? Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. You can see my presentation? Yes. Okay. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. And, you know, before I uh, get into the, you know, our organizational perspective on how we are supporting the decarbonization goals um, in the United States, I just want to give a bit of perspective from the part of the world that I come from and how electrification as a concept or as a strategy vary, varies from country to country. Like I come from India and I work for USGBC from a remote location. Um, and here, electrification, you know, we have about 400 million people uh, who lack electricity, who do not have access to electricity. So for us, the main goal is for electrification is to provide energy for all. And that's a major poverty alleviation um, tool that we look forward to electrifying villages, electrifying rural households and enable people to have their basic rights and basic access. So economy to economy, the, the challenges for electrification are different. And so I just wanted to give this perspective, but now just uh, switching uh, the context to United States. So we do recognize that electrifying buildings is critical to reduce building, built environments contribution to climate change. But the relationship between you know, several aspects, because buildings are a little complex in terms of uh, the overall operations, how it is, and the overall carbon impact of buildings uh, are start right from inception of buildings and the materials that goes into construction of buildings have a lot of embodied carbon so if you are trying to decarbonize the electricity sector then you have to look deeper into uh, what we need to do uh, and if you look at uh, the united states uh, overall energy consumption we will see that about 85 percent of the energy consumption in buildings is attributed by electricity and gas and electricity in turn gets generated from gas or renewable energy, coal or nuclear. Uh, and if I look at the emissions side by side, uh, the electricity, the emissions that come out from the electricity generation, if we try to apportion that to different end use sector, we will see that maximum of that is taken up by the industrial, residential and commercial buildings. So if you focus on the building sector per se so we are not only looking at electrification that is converting the users the end users that are currently depending on gas to electricity but also how we decarbonize uh, the electricity per se and look at an overall uh, kind of a decarbonization targets to be met 
so it it follows you know what we say that since it's a it's an integrated sector that has many aspects to it so if you look at the overall approach to low to zero carbon approach in building sector we look at uh, in addition to you know the associated emissions from the transportation sector that is tied up to the building sector uh, the, the key principles lie in reduction of the embodied jhg emissions that goes into uh, building material production and the during the operation stage the building energy related jhg emissions and now i'm going to focus only on the third aspect which is the building energy related jhg emissions and uh, here again the first principles first we look at efficiency then we look at the electrification how to make it uh, more greener uh, and cleaner and then we look at reduced embodied carbon and whatever is balanced we look at offsetting it uh, through uh, other means such as you know carbon offset so on and so forth uh, now uh, we have seen that over the years uh, you know there has been market shifts and technologies have evolved and heat pump technology also per se which were more expensive 10 years ago now they are more efficient and they are less expensive and they can even operate in extreme climates uh, car the electricity per se has also moved from you know more the being generated from coal to more uh, cleaner energy uh, being used to generate electricity and of course we cannot reduce uh, you know ignore the building retrofits that is achieved uh, that gives us the necessary energy efficiency which is an important tool towards reducing energy consumption in buildings and the embodied carbon reduction uh, now looking at heat pump efficiency across climates we find that the relative heating efficiency or the heating coefficient of performance for gas furnaces heat pumps in location across the country regardless of the climate zone we will find that the heat pumps are more and more efficient so that gives us enough uh, you know kind of leverage for le uh, leverage for utilizing technologies that can be all electric in addition to space heating being uh, switching to more uh, you know electric based uh, heating systems uh, we are also looking at technologies related to other end users that will help us to move towards a complete electrification for buildings which includes uh, end users such as water heating cooking uh, clothes drying and laundry and here also technologies are evolving or are in different stages of evolution and this is a snapshot from a new report that has been relayed, uh, released by the new buildings institute that summarizes these different technologies that will help to move towards a more electrified you know um, building sector and as i said in addition it's also very important to decarbonize the grid electricity and we have seen that you know this is, this was published in the new york times that how over time uh, the grid has become cleaner and the apportionment of coal has reduced say from 51% to 23% over 20 years um, and renewable energy component has also grown over the years so that is a uh, important pathway and the other thing which is in favor of electrification is that you know natural gas uh, used for indoor applications also leads to a lot of uh, uh, you know harmful indoor pollutants that are very very harmful for people who reside inside so that is a very very favorable uh, dialogue in favor of electrification of buildings uh, so what as you know so looking forward uh, we are looking at you know promoting more renewable energy uh, procurements through multiple models and there are multiple models possible and so what is usgbc doing what is what is it that we are doing so we are uh, the main proponents of the lead like we own the lead rating system and through the lead rating system we are influencing the building sector and through different credits within the rating system we prioritize renewable energy integration and we give more weightage or more points to buildings that adopt renewable energy and here also on-site generation gets the highest weightage and more number of points hence we kind of encourage uh, energy generation from cleaner sources and giving uh, more and more points to, or 
kind of incentivizing projects that switch to on-site generation followed by new off-site and then the third priority would be you know off-site renewable energy because we know that that is the least investment for on the part of the project proponent so this is the lead hierarchy for renewable energy uh, integration and finally what we look at is grid harmonization because we know that all these technologies as well as green electricity put together would require sensible use of electricity and hence demand flexibility and demand optimization through smart technologies is very critical. Uh, so this is something and we are also aware that several corporations have uh, kind of you know, committed to uh, 24 by 7 carbon, carbon free electricity and uh, google so i'm just reading out uh, the google's approach uh, this is being championed by google which has announced that its goal for 24 by 7 carbon free energy by 2030 the, this means that instead of matching their data uh, center energy use over the course of a year with 100 percent renewable energy purchased from anywhere in the world it will focus on matching hourly electricity use using locally sourced zero carbon energy so USGBC is very excited to track their progress, hoping that this example shows the way for other organizations to do the same. So again, through our credit structure, we have given uh, due consideration to grid harmonization, including peak load optimization, as well as tying up to you know, local demand optimization strategies that are offered by the local utilities. So all of this put together will help us to move towards uh, a greener and decarbonized energy sector, uh, decarbonized uh, building sector. Uh, and in conclusion, you know, I just want to say that as a pathway, uh, we look at first efficiency first, embodied energy reduction through use of uh, low embodied energy materials, electrification using green technologies, using greener sources, high performance design, load optimization, load management, and uh, on-site renewable energy integration. So all of these will help us to move towards uh, a greener building sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that detailed explanation of electrifying buildings. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, we have uh, a lot of questions here, so I wanted to be able to um, address some of these that have been popping up. So uh, first, I would like to uh, just open this one up to whoever thinks that they can answer this question. Um, how does large scale electrification interact with cybersecurity? So, well, I can. I don't. Yeah, yeah. I can, go, um, ahead, go ahead. I can jump in. Uh, maybe not only for cybersecurity, but overall, I mean, we electrify, but then electricity needs to be provided by grid or whoever. And all that infrastructure needs to be developed hand in hand. And for industry, especially, if you're electrifying some of this, especially heavy industry, that's a massive load to be generated, to be transmitted, and in a safe way, and cybersecurity is part of it. We did not look into this specifically, but the matters of cybersecurity, uh, like, you know, we have recently have this, you know, power cuts in different parts of US and things like that. So industrial plants are really worried about that. So overall, what I'm trying to say, not only cybersecurity, other aspects of power generation and distribution and delivery needs to be taken into account. So industry feel that, you know, comfortable to rely on electrification rather than uh, being worried and avoiding it. Mike or Millie, did you have something to add to that? Uh, no, I found my slide, though. I don't know if you can see it now. Excellent. But, all, you know, obviously, everything we do has to have a cybersecurity element to it. So whether we're talking about the truck at the charger, where, you know, the charger's talking to the truck about data and, and it's, um, you know, situation and context for charging, or, uh, or or any other aspect of these uh, these vehicles, um, cybersecurity needs to be a, a clear part of, of any discussions around a big vehicle, of course. Yes, and I also want to add, you know, like when we are talking about um, 
say smarter buildings and use of smart technologies for demand optimization demand management strategies so there's a lot of data that comes in from buildings and sometimes data may be sensitive so cyber security is very critical uh, for uh, for any operations in buildings i think that's crucial Thank you for that additional input. Um, Mike, could you give us a little bit of context for the visual that you're showing here? Yeah, so this is the 13 uh, truck deployments that I mentioned a little bit earlier. And so runonless.com is where you can watch this. What, what we're doing here is sharing the stories of these 13 real trucks, real drivers. These are all moving real freight in North America. So this isn't like dreams of the future or whatever. Now, it is pretty rudimentary, and, and maybe that's not the right term, but these are the early days. So the, the trucks that you can actually order and buy to be delivered later this year or next year are an improvement over these because these were earlier ones. But just a, a, a few sort of major findings that we've already come up with. Electric trucks are happening not just in California. So we see these um, deployments happening around the country. Uh, one point about California, though, is the heavy trucks, you know, all of those heavy tractors that are doing long distances that I mentioned um, or having a long day of driving with heavy loads. Those are happening in California because really we need incentives to make that that happen right now. The range really is about half of what they need. So, you know, a truck typically in these environments will do four or five hundred miles a year. These trucks are doing at best 150 to 200 miles. So. Um, so that that's the California piece, but you get outside of California and there's a lot of trucks in the, you know, medium or smaller uh, range, including these three terminal tractors. So these are tractors that move trailers around depots and yards, large, large, large yards um, where, um, you know, limited amount of um, a power demand because you're just moving the trailers around at low speeds on flat ground. Uh, that's really a beachhead for electric heavy duty trucks. And so, um, you know, those are some of the, it's also not just a Southern thing. You know, we hear often that electric trucks only work where the temperature's temperate and, uh, you know, not in mountains or in cold weather, et cetera. And so, you know, we're seeing, you know, Montreal, Minnesota, Chicago, New York City, places where, uh, you know, pretty severe winters um, as well as other demanding duty cycles. So that's what I was going to share here with, um, with this um, current look at where electric trucks are being deployed as we, as we really move into a sort of an adoption time period. Excellent. Thank Thanks, you. Liz. Thank you for sharing that graphic with us. Um, I have a question here that has been posed by a few people now, which is probably one of the things that I hear most when it comes to electrification, which is with all these new demands on the grid for electricity. Um, how is that being provided? And are those sources of energy being transitioned fast enough to renewable energy so we're not putting more carbon into the atmosphere by producing all these extra demands on, on the grid? And uh, what do you see in, in terms of that development? Well, I'll go first. These sectors are, we're, we're talking about real transformational things going on in these sectors, right? Moving from fuel in a truck with diesel to electricity, looking at little trucks, medium trucks, big trucks, like I've been talking about. Th th this is not going to happen in months or years. Um, you know, a, a fast pace would be years and a decade or two or three, maybe, right? So um, the, one of the things that I, I think when this question is asked that a lot of us think, oh, everything's jumping into electricity at this like step change mode, whether it's manufacturing buildings and, and transportation. And it, it, I, I think when we look back on it, it will feel fast, but we're still talking about, you know, at least in our view, a two to three year decade kind of thing. And so, man, wow, what, you know, what, what's happened, you know, since 1990 in our industries compared to 2021 um, with respect to, to where we're headed. So I think, um, you know, I think in general, we feel like there's, there's movement um, and trends that are unstoppable in the grid in some of these areas that will support that electrification um, of these of these different sectors, um, sort of in a pace that that um, you know some might say is gradual, others say is fast, but but I would summarize as manageable the way we think about it. Um, um. Uh, I also think you know particularly when I'm talking about the building sector that. Of course, uh, one needs to decarbonize the grid. 
and we are talking about switching to electricity as a major source for buildings. Uh, but it's equally important to introduce the efficiency uh, within buildings. You know, greener buildings are known to consume uh, about 50% lower energy than uh, a conventional building. So the first principle should be to be able to reduce the demand, uh, the demand optimization and you know, introduce efficiency. And once that is done, your work is, uh, you know, the future demand also will get tapered and it's, it will be much easier economically to switch to greener electricity. Yeah, just quickly, I uh, definitely want to detour that energy efficiency, people think we are done, we have done everything, we have not, there's still a lot of potential and moving forward, we definitely need to reduce the demand as much as possible while switching to electrification and other uh, uh, decarbonization levers. Uh, for industry, actually, we did the trend up to 2050 and we should, for most of the sectors, if we just electrify tomorrow everything, the emissions will increase and uh, because, uh, but we did use a US average grid emission factor, which, uh, you know, uh, from a state, I'm sharing actually this slide just for one industry, container glass industry. This is showing the change in CO2 emission. You can see in 2019, uh, if you use the US grid emission factor, your emissions will increase, even though your energy use will decrease actually when you electrify, but just the grid is not, decarbonize enough. But as we move forward with the assumptions we have made, which is shown in the table below, you can see then we tap into um, the, you know, CO2 emission reduction benefits. And this can vary from sector by sector, but this was fairly common in most of the sectors. But then when you go to state level, like if you do electrification now, for example, state of Washington, where there's a lot of hydro and, you know, lower green emission factor and some other states, you, you could have benefits even today. And actually, just to update the audience, we are actually now doing, as we speak, a state level analysis of this. This report was at the federal level, and now we are doing a state level analysis for 20 states and hoping to publish that report by end of the year. Uh, so yeah, decarbonization of grid is the must, but at the moment, we have some sweet spot we can start with. Thank you, Ali. And, and sticking with that with you, um, uh, another question that came up directed to you specifically was, how can the peak demands on the grid be handled if you can't turn it off or shut it down? And they're wondering what kind of strategies are discussed in the industry when it comes to grid management? That's a very good question. So um, when we talk about you know, the load and demand, uh, like when we talk about demand response, a lot of people think about you know, this massive you know, uh, electric cars, it's gonna be a huge battery, so industry, as is electrifier will turn into this kind of huge virtual battery with proper management and demand response actually can be a benefit to many utilities and power sector. But for the time that they do need the, the power and the load, the utilities need to be able to provide that. Uh, many industries, they have flexibilities, but some industries they do not. So definitely industries, companies or plants before they switch certification, they want to make sure the needs to be met. And that's one of those prerequisites or requirement before people make that shift. And, uh, Anna, sorry, oh, I was gonna say, uh, a, a follow up to that was um, what are the main barriers for industries that aren't as energy intensive? Uh, an example that this, uh, that the question gave was biotech or medical devices. Yeah, name it, food, textile, many other sectors. Um, so in our report, we have like 10 pages discussion on barriers. We actually surveyed industrial plants. Uh, this work was done with Renewable Thermal Collaborative. They have many industrial plants as members. We surveyed them, so we got actual feedback from them. So you can see we categorize as an economic barrier, technical barrier, workforce, etc. So there is a huge range of barrier. But if I want to just mention one, I think price is all a very strong signal. At the moment, we did energy cost comparison between conventional technology and electrified technology for all these 13 sectors and also boilers. In all cases, by far, electrified technology energy costs will be higher 
because in U.S. natural gas is just so damn cheap and electricity actually relatively expensive. Uh, but we did a kind of sensitivity analysis. If you know in the future certain you know uh, uh, reduction in renewable energy costs happen, which a lot of people commented and uh, were optimistic that will be uh, uh, realistic. And also, if there is some price on carbon, we did not analyze that, but that will you know increase the natural gas prices. So. What I'm trying to say, energy costs at the moment is a huge barrier. So if I'm an industrial company, it just doesn't make sense in many sectors. Uh, so that needs to change. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, one more question when it comes to industries and their utilization of energy. Um, somebody was asking what you think those maybe top three industries would be that are most unable to switch to electrification in the near term from you guys's perspective if you if you all have an answer for that oh uh, we can i can start with the industry um some of the high temperature like cement we do not have any commercial i mean it's being worked on developed but it's gonna take probably another 15 20 years uh, if things uh, work out. So cement definitely is high. Uh, some of the, you know, chemical petroleum refining is just so complex integrated processes. You can electrify part of the processes, but uh, it will be challenging to kind of electrify the entire sector. So off the top of my head, those two I, I can find. Too. So in, in trucking, Liz, I mean, the uh, there, there's two things here, right? There's one can a battery electric truck haul the freight? Of course it can, but the battery becomes so big, so heavy that it becomes impractical for these large trucks. So, um, you know, so it, it, it can, but these long haul over the road, sometimes with team drivers that are doing, you know, a thousand miles a day calling big freight, um, that's very challenging for, if not not very challenging or very expensive to do with a battery electric truck. That's where hydrogen as a um, range extender on an electric truck is um, a, you know a really good solution as we develop the the fuel cells the infrastructure and how we can produce more you know greener or green ish um, hydrogen so um yeah that's a way we'd answer it in trucking and Melee, did you have any insights from the building uh industry uh, so, you know, in terms of electrification, I think uh, all possible end users are electrifiable. That's not an issue at all. I, I do not see a challenge per se, but uh, like all industry, you know, sometimes it makes sense to not switch some of the sources for economic purposes, etc. For example, you know, if I, uh, if I take some examples from, from India, uh, we have, as I said, for us, electricity is a shortage. We do not have access all the time, right? So here you have to manage with on-site and uh, other sources, maybe not renewable energy all the time, uh, and partly available, partially available electricity. So what people like large corporations do is that they have, uh, you know, demand, say, suppose they use... Um, uh, electrically operated chillers, but they used brine solutions, et cetera, to store as thermal storage, uh, you know, provisions they keep within the building. And during off peak hours, they will store ice or they will uh, use brine storage and which they will use in the, uh, you know, during the times when the electricity is more expensive. So uh, it is not always uh, driven by what can be done. Uh, the choices are also driven by so many other external conditions. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's a, a great mm. point to leave yeah. off on because that's about all the time that we have for, for today. So thank you all so much for joining in this session and providing these additional resources over in the chat box for anyone who is interested in following up on anything that you have outlined or said or uh, presented today. And um, we also invite all of our audience members to participate in the survey that is pinned at the top of the chat box. So please uh, direct uh, your mouse over there and uh, we will see you guys back in the main sessions. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.
Bye.